This is HMS Illustrious, the mothership leading her international task group east of Suez. Merlin helicopters are guarding her through these dangerous waters. But she's also about to get her most powerful weapon, the awesome GR9 Harrier jump jet. Lusty's made it through the Suez Canal and is now docked in the Middle East, which means the officers are cutting a dash in their tropical whites. The long flex can just get kind of caught. The Harriers are due aboard in five days, but right now they're expecting another important visitor. Yeah, we say salute, all right, and down. So up, salute, down, and then we'll get all together, okay? The commander in chief is coming for dinner. Do not drop a salute until you've part and carry on, okay? Come up, everybody come up, the captain will, the captain will salute along with you as he comes up to the top, step forward, evening sir, off we go. In the captain's galley, a dinner fit for an admiral is underway. We've got a swordfish starter with tagliatelle ribbons, prawn risotto and a smoked salmon carbonara sauce with saffron in it. It's down to the captain steward, Freddie, to make sure presentation is perfect. This is what you're all taught in like basic stewarding training, you know, talk how to lay a table, what sort of glasses you need for different drinks, talk different napkin folds. Napkin's called the cox comb. But serving the admiral means missing out on shore leave. It's part of the job as a steward and that. You do get a lot of dignitaries, VIPs and that, so. I swings and roundabouts now, we'll get ashore another time, but it's a lot of work that has to go into it. Admiral Sir Mark Stanhope is the Commander-in-Chief of the whole of the Navy fleet. He oversees 104 ships and 35,000 sailors. I have to train them, I have to maintain them, I have to ensure they're stored. I have to make sure that they're prepared and available to be used by the government as they require. Aboard Lusty, he's the next best thing to royalty. Now you need a couple of spoons yeah. in your jug, a couple of water. Yeah. 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 19 year old China has been drafted in for the night to help the captain's chef. Still quite, I personally think it's still quite hectic, because right? it's all kicking off now, isn't it? Normally, Shiner cooks quantity, not quality, for hundreds of hungry sailors down in the ratings mess. Down in the main house, about 400 people, but tomorrow is 13. You would stand by. Take from this end, please. Got one to go over here as well, Shiner. I don't want that skinny bit on there, mate. Another new recruit for the evening is Shiner's twin sister, Rachel. She normally works in the officer's dining room. So it has been down well, so it's all, it's all good so far. There's no shortage of ingredients in the captain's galley. For our main course, we've got a fillet of beef, which has been marinated in dry herbs and spices. We serve that on a flat and a potato with sauteed spinach, roasted red peppers, and fennel with a tomato and fennel jib. George's gourmet creations are going down a treat with the Admiral. But deep in the bowels of the ship, there are less savoury matters to attend to. Those, those toilets, basically, it's like chlorine. It's got infected because it's proper stinking. And seriously, right, we need to get unhappy living allowance for this. We need to get paid to live down here. All right. I swear, because it's <laughs> okay? All right. <laughs> Dave Smith, one of the ship's marine engineers, or stokers, has been called in to sniff out the problem. The smell is caused by this toilet. Well, that's that problem fixed. The, uh, there wasn't enough water in the toilet. So obviously the air was coming up through the trap and uh, polluting the smell. All they had to do was flush it. <laughs> Rachel's finished serving the Admiral and Stoker Dave's off maintenance duty. So they're planning an evening in together. No. Oh, oh. 
no. That's <laughs> yeah. definitely no. Why do you always go for the gory ones where people get eaten by humans? What's the one about? Choice. If I've got a problem, I know that I can go to Dave and talk to Dave about it and he'll help me out and he doesn't judge it, he doesn't judge anyone. He's always so laid back and he's just lovely. Oh, no, why, why would you do that? <laughs> I'm watching that. <laughs> I met, I met Rachel when she came on board and that. Um, she's just a good crack. She's a good laugh, yeah. But Rachel's got a boyfriend back home. It can get confusing. I mean, if I didn't love him to bits, then, yeah, maybe I would try on with Dave. <laughs> Can't believe we just said that, but... End of the day, if you meet someone that you really like, I personally think you should be with them. If um, if you're even thinking about being unfaithful to the partner you're with at the moment, there's no point in being with them. You might as well not be. That's the way I look at it anyway. Watch this space. <laughs> HMS Illustrious is leading an international task group to the Indian Ocean. She's got an arsenal of weaponry and a squadron of six Merlin helicopters, but as yet, she's missing her deadliest hardware. The squadron who are flying out to Illustrious are called the Naval Strike Wing. They're heading off from RAF Cottesmore in the East Midlands. The ship, we all love it, it's all there. For some of you, you won't have been to the ship before. Uh, it will be an eye opener. And for those old hands of us who've going back on again, it'll be like uh, going back home. Uh, just be aware. We're taking uh, seven pilots, uh, three engineering officers, and about 40 uh, engineers themselves to look after the aircraft. So it's quite a big team. The qualities of a Harrier pilot identify uh, very early on. And what we're looking for is people who are dynamic, quick thinking. They have to be able to fly, talk and navigate. They are the cream of the crop. We've got two brand new guys who've never landed a, a Harrier on board before and the other guys have never landed on board at night before. So it's lots of, lots of new things for everyone. Lieutenant Dave Boyack was a helicopter pilot before he started flying jump jets. He'll be attempting his first ever landing on a carrier. I'd always wanted to get onto jets a little bit faster. Um, I've been done for speeding quite a few times. At least I get to do it legally in this. The most junior pilot is 26-year-old Nick Mattock. I've only been with the squadron for three weeks so far, so uh, it's quite exciting. My first three weeks on the squadron, I'm off uh, onto an aircraft carrier. I'm doing my initial carrier qualification in the first week we're out there, so you have to uh, practice taking off and landing quite a few times, because it's quite tricky for me. Training Dave and Nick is RAF squadron leader Rich Hillard. Flying off the aircraft carrier is probably about as hard a type of flying as you can do. It's very, very challenging, but it's very satisfying when you get it right. Um, and, and really, most pilots, I think, enjoy a challenge. Um, it's why we do the job. The Harrier pilots know there are mixed feelings about them amongst Lusty's crew. These guys live on the board, it's their home, it's where they work, and then suddenly a whole bunch of pilots turn up and think that they're the best things in sliced bread. So they'll always think that we're prima donnas who think that everything revolves around us, and we will banter them for being, uh, you know, well, fish heads is what we call them. So most importantly, this is my packed lunch for the journey, so I don't know what I've got in there, but I'll uh, have a look when I uh, get airborne, probably some sarnies and a drink. That's got 9721 clear take off main, service so wind 34012. They'll be travelling at 500 miles per hour, and they'll do the 4,000 mile journey in two legs. So, from RAF Cottesmore, they'll have a five hour flight to Cyprus, where the pilots can have a rest and the planes can be serviced before heading on to the ship. For now, the top dogs, or rather top cats on board Lusty, are 814 Squadron, better known as the Flying Tigers. They pilot six anti-submarine Merlin helicopters, and they're used to having the flight deck to themselves. It always seems as soon as the jets come on board, then they tend to take priority. The pilots tend to be considered, certainly by the Rotary guys, as sort of shandy drinkers. So they bring a lot to the ship 
but uh, they don't get treated any differently. They're, they're just another weapon system on the ship. Yeah, looking forward to working with them over the course of this exercise. Honest. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> Today, the Flying Tigers have a different kind of mission, taking the chaplain, Father David Yates, to another ship in the fleet. This morning, I'm going over to the, the Spanish ship to say mass. We're going across in a helicopter, and we're going to be uh, winched down onto the, um, onto the Spanish ship because our helicopters are too big and too heavy uh, to land on their deck. Normally, a transfer to another ship would be by boat, but the last time he tried it, the Bish fell in. Commander Tim Johnston takes up the story. Okay. Yeah, he was transferring over to another ship. <laughs> he fell. <laughs> Just leave me alone. No. <laughs> Should we do it tomorrow? <laughs> D David was uh, unfortunate uh, to be involved as a man overboard. He was transferring over to another ship by boat, and when he got to the bottom of the ladder, he missed the boat, his foot in slipped, and he ended up in the water. Here we go. Here we go. Uh, much to everyone's amusement, whilst the people on the quarterdeck, they saw him floating past. The idea that chaplains can walk on water in the style of Jesus is a constant joke in the Navy, and I, as I proved, I wasn't able to walk on water, and I was very glad of the life jacket. It, it's quite legendary any time David has to go to another ship to try and have them go by boat, but I doubt we'll see that happen again. I'm not quite as terrified about it as I'm pretending to be. I think sometimes people feel it's good to, uh, you know, they're their bish, you know, never mind, and uh, take me under their wing. So uh, I do tend to play to the galleries a little bit. But if I'm honest, the thought of hanging out of a helicopter on a piece of string doesn't really appeal that much, but I'll, I'll survive. Safely aboard, the Spanish crew welcomes Lusty's man of God. Cheers. With an offering that settles his nerves. Hmm. A very nice draft beer it is too. Mm. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. Through your goodness we have this wine to offer. The blood of Christ. His work here is done, and the Spanish Navy once again extend their hospitality. I'm quite looking forward to this. Well, this is a Spanish omelette, Spanish tortilla. Mm. Very good. Mm. Oh, please. As the task group's religious ambassador, it would be rude to refuse. <laughs> Hey? How, how is the wine? Mm -hmm. The wine is lovely, very nice indeed. Back on Lusty, the ship's beginning to look like the Costa del Sol. They have the sun, they have the sea, but as long as they're on board, that's as far as they can go. to say in a community of nearly a thousand people, um, there's always a chance that relationships could arise, but it's very clear there's a no touching me on board, and on board the ship, there's absolutely no physical interaction between people. People are, are sensible, they know, they know the rules on board, and uh, in the main, they, they stick to those rules. But Jason Farnsworth has his own hypothetical solution. How would someone get around the no touching rule? If I've seen a bird on a ship, I'd just be like, right. For instance, meet me in this compartment. I bet no one will be in there for about half an hour. And then that's probably how you get around the no touching rule. And then you could probably get up to quite a bit of touching. If you get caught, yeah, fair enough, you get killed. But and like, obviously, if you didn't, then like, I wouldn't do it. I just don't think it's right. The no touching rule's proving difficult for Rachel and Dave, who have been getting closer. When you're in like a city street or whatever, you meet a guy, you spend ages like finding out about them. But on somewhere like a ship, you find out stuff about them really quickly. So even though you've known each other, say, a couple of months, it feels like you've known each other a year or whatever. But things aren't going well with her boyfriend back home. 
love him to bits, I always will, but it's just hard because I haven't spoken to him in such a long time. We basically agreed that he'll still be there when I get back and everything, but while I'm away, it's best to call it off for a bit, I suppose. It's the best way to put it. <laughs> but Lust is a warship, not a love boat. And in the next 48 hours, she'll sail past the war-torn states of the Sudan, Eritrea and Somalia, a failed state, harbouring terrorists. Right, listen in. As I said, this is a general check today, OK? Make sure people have their equipment and then we're going to run through one or two procedures, OK? This area is one of the uh, most dangerous areas for piracy in the world, OK? Um, therefore, there's a high threat to uh, merchant vessels. Part of our job is to conduct anti-terrorist operations and anti-drug operations. Therefore, every ship within the task group needs to have a boarding team ready to go. Navy boarding parties are made up of volunteers. This is a new group being put through their paces. You can be any trade, any job on board. You can always get detailed off to do a boarding party. All different trades, you've got engineers, you've got a writer here who works in personnel, chefs do it as well. You don't have to just be warfare, you be all sorts. Before they're allowed into a real situation, they're doing some role-playing on Illustrious. But I want to practice both teams, so first team in, do that, OK? Then second team in, yeah? OK, cool. But there's a problem with the radios. That I got from the bridge, and it's dead. P.O. Knight needs to be aware of that, because um, that's unacceptable on that. I'll have a go at them when I get up there. When the radios are fixed, there's some confusion over their call signs. Sierra Charlie, this is Zulu Alpha, over. You're Zero Alpha. Hey, I'm Zero Alpha. Yeah, can you pass me the cast? That one doesn't work, does Sierra it? Sierra Charlie, this is Zero Alpha, over. Doesn't matter, doesn't matter. The first stage of the boarding exercise is to launch the inflatables and reboard Lusty as if she were a hostile vessel. But there's a problem with the life jackets. They're up there at the moment because we didn't get told we were going to get brought in use. That's why. That's fine, no problem at all. We get them down today, we get them okay. put in the boat bay, they're all checking them in their service boat. Launching the inflatables is abandoned for a search of the ship. What I want to do is see proper cover and move, OK, throughout here. I know it's false, I know we're on board the ship, but I want to see cover and move. Those who haven't got a rifle, OK? Just the old finger treatment, OK? We've all done it. <laughs> Good. A suspicious parcel's been hidden in the hangar. OK. Yeah, well, just imagine you're in a passageway as expected on a merchant ship. OK, happy, move on now. Just keep looking ahead. After their teething problems, the rookie boarding party have got their act together. Good, that's good. OK, we're moving back across this way, coming across now. And it's not long before they sniff out something fishy in the corner. John, if you stand guard on that, don't let anybody near it. It's mission accomplished with an explosive discovery. Cool, happy with that. That was good. Next day, the flight deck crew are getting ready for the big arrival. The Harriers are coming to the end of their journey to join Lusty. Flying with them is a refuelling plane, which one day moves in the air with the jets at various points on the journey. The tanker takes 10 minutes to fill up each jet with 8,000 litres of fuel. The final leg of their journey from Cyprus will take over three and a half hours. The Harrier Squadron's newest pilot, Nick Mattock, has already arrived by a less glamorous mode of transport. Well, it's quite exciting to be back on the ship, especially uh, being one of the guys going to be flying off it um, back on. Um, yeah, it's quite good fun. Got a speedboat out from the, uh, from the dock and climbing up the side on a rope ladder, so it's all very nautical. All right, but it's not, it doesn't look as though it's better be there. It shouldn't be there. All right, carry on, eyes down. It's not a Sunday morning stroll. The flight deck crew do their final check for FOD, or foreign object debris. And it's flight deck officer John Llewellyn's job to make sure the runway's spotless. 
Picking up any loose articles or any items that are liable to damage an aircraft engine or personnel on the flight deck can range from a piece of ground equipment that just hasn't been secured properly to paint flecks that could be ingested or get blown into someone's face. Yeah, I've seen a whole squadron written off. Eight jets in a row because they didn't clean the deck properly after it came out of a refit. That was a nightmare. Uh, flag of Joe, uh, fully jet recovery. Plan A, obviously, into the graveyard. I'd like to put all four uh, jets in there. All positions, Flyco, uh, Shekhan, on deck. Oh, there you go. There they come. Eyes left, sir. Let's Aircraft carrier HMS Illustrious is about to reach her full fighting capability. Already on board is newbie Harrier pilot Nick Mattock. Is it, oh yeah, and then it's just keep going up, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I'll find it. It's just at like these, isn't it, all the way? Yeah. Sweet. He's going up on deck to watch his friend Dave Boyack attempt to land on the aircraft carrier. It's Dave's first time, but uh, I'm sure he'll be fine. He's done it before in a helicopter, so what could possibly go wrong? I should get my first go at it tomorrow, so if you uh, maybe a bit of a sleepless night tonight worrying about it, but I'm sure it'll be fine. Just cleared with Flyco, the flight deck is ready in all respects to uh, recover jets. So we're good to go. Jet recovery is quite an exciting time. If you can imagine, these are flying bricks now. They are literally being held up by jet power. And there's a lot happening, and it's happening very fast. As the Harrier pulls alongside Illustrious, its Rolls-Royce Pegasus engine, running at full throttle, is producing 22,000 pounds of thrust, enough to lift 10 cars off the ground. Almost its entire engine thrust is diverted downwards through its four main nozzles. But this isn't the clever bit. Because it's stationary, its ailerons, rudder and elevators used to steer in flight are useless. So the pilot controls the Harrier by directing some of the engine's thrust to mini-jet nozzles on the tail, wingtips and nose. By opening and closing these mini-jets, the Harrier is now being controlled like a spacecraft. Last down and making his very first deck landing is Dave Boyack. I've done about 100 deck landings with helicopters, but just a completely different beast with a jet. So. Mm. Yeah, the whole nerves were going, I didn't expect them to be. Instructor Rich, aka Bolly, is already settling in. On the long transits that, that we do, you can put the autopilot in, which does mean that you don't have to physically be flying the aeroplane constantly. You've got time to get a bottle of water out of your bag. You, know, you can even read a couple of pages of a book or something as you're going along, or play trivial pursuit over the radio, listening, you know, listening for questions. Probably the hardest thing, of course, is if you need the toilet. But if you do, um, I haven't got one to show you, but there are um, little, we call them pee bags, which are just plastic bags with a tube on the end and some foam in. And after a lot of unstrapping, which I'm not going to demonstrate to you, uh, you can potentially have a wee and, uh, and then put it somewhere at the side of the cockpit. You're going to love that, aren't you? You're going to absolutely love that line. With all four Harriers now safely down, all eyes are on Nick for his first deck landing tomorrow. The magnifying glass will be out. Yeah, no pressure at all after that, is there? That would be all right. Mm, what could possibly go wrong? I won't sneak out to the jet the morning before and put all the switches in the wrong place. <laughs> It'll be fine. Probably wouldn't notice anyway. <laughs> The Harrier pilots all have officer rank, so share the same floor as the other officers, directly below the flight deck. They're the noisiest cabins on the ship. That tends to wake you up if you're here and you've got about four foot above your head, several thousand pounds of thrust landing. <laughs> all, the, all the deck heads shake. In fact, I had to re-secure this one because I joined a friend of mine who lived in the cabin opposite um, said, oh, come on, come into this cabin. Fine, came into this cabin not knowing this. And uh, it landed and the deckheads fell off and 
promptly hit me on the head overnight, which was nice. A bit of a wake-up call. I don't think it's that warm up here, to be honest with you. Noise isn't the only problem. It's boiling hot in the cabins, even when the air conditioning is working. It's, it's quite warm up here at the moment. I wouldn't say it's roasting, but it's quite warm. Luckily, stoker Dave Smith is on hand to fix it. I don't think I would uh, like to sleep up here. I haven't stuffed anything up my air conditioning unit. Give it a smash. Oh, it's going to have snags, this. Hopefully, once we clear, take this baffle out, as you see, if there's any, any problems with it. <laughs> and uh, hopefully, this, this flow should be, be less restricted. Right, go for that. It's not just the cabins that are hotting up. The temperature's also rising between Dave and Rachel. Fair to say that me and Dave are really close. <laughs> I'd say, yeah, I'd say me and Rachel were a couple, yeah. As any, like, couples want to do when they say goodbye to each other, oh, I've got to go to work, goodbye, you want to give them a quick kiss or whatever, or a quick hug, whatever like that. And have you ever been caught? No, I've never been caught. Never done anything to get caught at. <laughs> Girls down the mess, they've got to be out by half ten. It's not allowed down here after that. Because there's too many naughty stokers having sleepovers with friends and they're wrecked. Did you say that's not us? I don't even no. know where your rack is. Really? <gasps> so why did, I, why, did I, why did I have to give you two a shake the other day? <laughs> <laughs> it's a simple question. There you go, boy, right? <coughs> <laughs> uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. I'm working here. Yeah. All right. I'll see you later. Catch you later, lads. I'll see you later. See you later. Bye. That is our goodbye because we can't do nothing else because we're getting trouble. So that has got to be our goodbye. <laughs> It's Nick's big day. He's about to attempt his first takeoff and landing from the aircraft carrier. Hey, I got nervous. Didn't sleep very well last night. Um, it's all a bit apprehensive. So Dave did it yesterday, so you know, he got rid of a few of the nerves. But uh, yeah, it's uh, well, quite nerve-wracking, really. The jets are fueled and ready to go. For many of the deck crew. This is their first jet launch, and tension is high. Engines are started, and the aircraft line up for takeoff. Okay. Okay. So, let's complete. Let's launch the jet. Roger. Launch the jet. Nice. Dave and Bolly are airborne. But Nick has got a problem with his sat nav. The GPS crashed, so he's got no navigation in the air. Literally, it's like the last minute and everything's cancelled. He has to sit there and watch his oppos kill off the ramp, which is, as far as I know, is about the most frustrating thing that can happen to them. Couldn't get the uh, finance system in the jet to work properly, so couldn't go, unfortunately. A bit annoying. Nick will just have to wait another day for his first takeoff from an aircraft carrier. Four floors below the flight deck, the captain's galley is an oasis of calm. When he's not doing dinner parties for dignitaries, George, the captain's personal chef, prepares a gourmet meal for one. I'm doing a tuna steak served on a bed of Chinese leaves with a lime and mango salsa to go with that. And a ham steak with um, chorizo flavoured couscous. But it's going to need a bit of lemon juice just to bring out the flavour of the orange. 
to, to go with the gammon and the chorizo, because to me, orange and anise goes quite nicely together. Two floors further down, in the ratings mess, you can forget finesse. This is cooking on an industrial scale. George has got a life of luxury up there in the captain's place. But obviously, his, his numbers change. Sometimes he has eight or ten people. All Navy chefs are trained to cook to the highest standard, but the reality for most of them is providing 3,000 meals a day on a tight budget. It's about £1.78, £1.80 a day at the moment. Um, and uh, ironically, that's actually uh, less than uh, the average prisoner gets uh, when he's at Her Majesty's pleasure, uh, and also uh, less than the allowance for uh, an MOD guard dog. The budget for the captain's meals is a lot higher, but he does pay the extra out of his own pocket. Yeah, it's a privilege he's, uh, he's got a hard job, the captain, and to, to feed him to the quality that I'm allowed to do, maybe he lifts him at the end of the day. Gosh, George is excelling. Normally it's beans on toast. <laughs> Back in the ratings mess, it's Scran for 700. The galley staff are bracing themselves for the usual whinging. You get people are like, oh, there's onions in this again. You think, well, unfortunately, we get as much as we get, and it has to be built up. And we try and cater for the people who don't like onions and mushrooms. And unfortunately, sometimes it doesn't work out that way. You have the good days and the bad days. Onions, mushrooms, and absolutely everything. Raw potatoes, cold potatoes, or burnt potatoes. Shocking. <laughs> the longer you're at sea, the more they sort of get despondent with everything. If it's a genuine sort of complaint, you'll rectify it and try and make it better for them. But sometimes it's just they're moaning for moaning's sake. I wouldn't even feed that to my dog. <laughs> Got hammer. <laughs> Look at that. Rock on. See my cursor? Yeah. Rolly cursor over there. Millie Harradine is a trainee officer in the warfare department, where she's learning how to operate the ship in combat situations. The Y means it's a helicopter. The track number is specific to that contact. At the beginning of the deployment, she had high hopes for her new career. I'm not saying I want to be the next admiral of the fleet, but yeah, you know, I'll set my sights quite high and I want to achieve the best result that I can personally, just for myself. The tick tells me that it's been correlated, so it's two data links. Eight weeks on, and she's having serious doubts. Concur on that. Personally, I find it quite, it's quite boring. It's a lot of computers. Aside from her technophobia, a life at sea doesn't fit in with her romantic plans. I'm going to be able to be at home a lot more often, going to marry my other half, by the way. But that's not the reason why I want to transfer. It's, it's the actual job for me. I don't want to be a war officer. It doesn't appeal to me in the slightest to find it mind-numbing. <laughs> Millie's going to see her personnel officer. She wants to transfer to logistics, yeah. which means she could spend more time in the UK. Appreciate that. I mean, one of the most difficult things about your situation at the moment is obviously the Royal Navy as a whole is, is short of um, female warfare officers and obviously we're quite overborne with uh, female logistics officers which makes it that much more difficult for you. Apart from obviously changing sex, there's not a lot we can do about it. Okay, thanks very much. No problem. Training Millie for 18 months has cost the Navy around £60,000. It's quite difficult. We've obviously invested quite a lot of money in her as a warfare officer already, um, so it will be difficult for her. Um, I do hope, hope for the best, but I mean, it, it's going to be hard and it's going to be a challenge. Nick's sat nav is fixed, and once again, he's preparing for his first flight off a carrier. Quite an exciting day, quite a big day. I've been on squadron for three weeks, uh, and sort of the culmination of all my, my training, and then finally land on a carrier. I'm shitting myself, really. And he's not just taking off and landing. He'll be flying an air defence exercise. So I'll pretend I'm coming in to do an airstrike on the ship. And then obviously will trying to fight me off and shoot me down. Um, and I'll be using certain manoeuvres and chat and flare and things to try and defeat their radars. But I don't think I'm going to get anywhere near the ships. <laughs> there's, uh, there's quite a few of them out there. And I'm sure they'll shoot me down a long way out. Nick's friend Dave Boyack and instructor Bolly are also taking part. I think the day you stop learning is the day you should stop doing the job, really. So, uh, you know, uh, the most experienced Harrier pilot in the world will always be learning something every trip he does.
Illustrious has a relatively short runway because Harriers can land vertically. And her ski jump design lets them launch from the deck even when they're weighed down with fuel and bombs. First off is Dave, then Bolly, and finally Nick makes his first ever deck takeoff. Sometimes when you're you know, down at low level and you're trying to evade a threat, you really are performing the jet quite hard. So 6G, and not added to that, it's about 35 degrees outside because we're, we're down in the Gulf and um, sat in the jet with no air conditioning, it's pretty bloody warm. The pilots start their attack. Flying very low and turning sharply, they hope to break contact with the ship's radar-controlled goalkeeper gun. We're flying along at 500 knots and um, 100 feet, so that's you know, pretty much 600 miles an hour. If you don't pay a lot of attention, you could quite rapidly end up in the sea. Going around the corner, pulling hard on the jet, it's like a racing driver in his, his racing car when he goes around getting lateral G. Uh, Cougar 3, turn left heading 180. Pull up! Pull up! If you, if you pull too hard, you'll actually eventually grey out, the blood will drain from your brain. The jets drop flares and spin away to confuse heat-seeking missiles. Now for the tricky bit. Nick's lining up for his first ever deck landing. Point three. Good. Roger. That's probably going to overshoot slightly because he's coming fast. <laughs> Lieutenant Commander Toby Everett is in flight control to guide the jets in. If they're 10 foot either side, you know, it's no dramas, then we'll start. Wind is red five at 27. To land like this, the Harrier must nearly be running on empty, otherwise it's too heavy to hover. That's a good height. And whilst it's hovering, the engine's cooled by water, and Nick's only got enough to last him 90 seconds. Come right. Come right. Well, nice work. Two the landing's definitely more alarming. The takeoff is just sort of get launched off the end and it's fine. It's uh, landing concentrates the mind a little bit. <laughs> Flying is finished for the day, and the off duty crew are making the most of the flight deck. For team sports enthusiasts, the PT department's hosting an alternative. OK, first game on! Naval Strike Wing 2 versus WE1! Hey, what we're doing is we're having an um, afternoon of deck hockey in the glorious sunshine. It's just good to laugh a bit of steam, a bit of uh, inter-department, inter-domestic rivalry. Basically, to find out who is the best deck hockey team, generally just people are just sort of trying to get a day off work. OK, hold your stick on top of it, white, screen ball! It can be quite violent at times, hockey sticks and people barging around. Without the proper kit, the players have managed to make do. Well, we've gone for a, a composite design using various cardboard-based materials, mostly. Um, gaffer tape. Gaffer yeah. tape and basically whatever else we could find. The shoes are the most important, though. Let's go into the shoes. Yeah. Steel toe steel, steel, steel cap. Toe cap. <laughs> Obviously, because we wouldn't want anyone to get hurt. Over the top, unlucky! Most of the ship's departments are fielding a team, and Nick Mattock is playing for the Harriers. 
Oh, I got roped into it at the last minute. I wasn't really expecting it this morning. But uh, yeah, it'd be nice if we won. But Lusty's top brass aren't joining in. I did want to play. We were going to put a Hodge team together, but it gives the other people a chance to win if we don't play. First round's over and the naval strike wing, the Harriers, are showing they're made of strong stuff. We won, obviously. Yay. It's always good. He even scored a goal as well. I think we won, was it 4-1? 4-1. Yeah, yeah. It's good. I'm going to take George down, I'm watching. This is the final and I think the naval strike wing are looking quite good. So for, for a, a squadron that we haven't seen at sea for quite a long time, it's good to see them doing it. It's naval strike wing versus weapons engineering. The jets against the ship. It's two all. The game and the whole competition goes to the golden goal. We won all four games, obviously. We was losing 2 0 in the final, and we got we won 3 2 on there. Golden goal, so obviously the WWE saved it for the ship again as always. But Millie Harradine's not having fun. She's having a career crisis. It looks like her transfer request to logistics has been turned down. I do know that they're going to say no, but it's not official yet. I don't want to wait two months till it is official. We're just wasting time as far as I'm concerned, just treading water. Because I'm still technically under training, I can leave today if I want to. And that's what I'm going to do. So that's me, basically. And it's a convenient moment to go, because the ship's back in port in the Middle East. Hello. Hi, sir. Come in. Come to speak to you. OK. About my life. She's brought her letter of resignation to Ian Taylor, her training supervisor. I can understand your motivation. I think it's a shame that you feel this way. I don't want to do warfare, I know that. I'd, I'd rather go outside. All right, cool. Lee. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that, sir. Yeah, I sorry you tried. <laughs> Yeah, we did try, certainly. Yeah, I know. All right, thank you. Thank you. I'll go and pack. But she's got a lot of potential to do very, very well in the Navy. But it is a shame. I am disappointed. I'm feeling quite relieved, quite good. Made the right decision. I'm not really sad, don't have any regrets. After 18 months of training, Millie abandoned ship and the Navy. Next time on Warship, the Harriers take on their next challenge, landing in the dark. Oh, and the Tigers show off their big guns. <laughs>